Hey, this is Charlie Thompson, and welcome to Chapter 7, Politics and Power for Human Geography. So we'll look at politics, power, we're going to talk about how geography figures into these basic questions. So uh, some of the big questions, the actual questions that we'll look at in this, in this chapter, rather, what are the different types of states? Yeah, what, what does the word state even mean? We'll look at that. Why do groups want independence? What are the main political cultures in the U.S.? How do we organize space for elections? So we'll talk about electoral politics and gerrymandering, as well as electoral cartography. We'll talk about how states project power and political landscapes. So some basic terms, country versus state versus state. A country is a distinct territorial body or political entity, as opposed to a state a state is generally considered a group of people under a system of governments with a monopoly on the use of violence, the use of force. So typically in a state, only the, the government, the government is the only group, the only body that gets to use force. So we have things like the military, we have uh, police. We call what in other countries would be provinces, we call those states, which is probably confusing for political scientists, but what are you going to do? So the things that we call states, like California, California, uh, well, it's a group of people under a system of governments with a monopoly on force, but the state, in, in the terms of California, our state doesn't have a monopoly on force. The federal government has a monopoly on force, and it's allowing the state of California to use some of its power. So a nation, on the other hand, is a community of people formed on the basis of a common language, history, ethnicity, or a common culture, and in many cases, a shared territory. Now that last part, and in many cases, a shared territory, that's, that's a very interesting idea. If you, if you think about it for a minute, that means that you could have a nation without a state. Right? So a country is a distinct territorial body or political entity. A state is a group of people. So you could have a country, or rather you could be a nation without having a country. And the Kurds are a really good example of that. We'll take a look at the Kurds later. So a nation, a community of people formed on the basis of a common language, history, ethnicity, common culture, and in many cases, a shared, ter ter shared territory. Sometimes they are nation states. A nation state is a state in which the majority shares the same culture and is conscious of it. The nation state is an ideal in which cultural boundaries match political boundaries. So in many ways, the United States is a nation state. You could also statelessness. Uh, the Palestinians could be an example of statelessness where they are, they are a nation, but they don't have a state. In this case, the Israeli government has the monopoly on the use of force, the monopoly on violence, usually directed against the Palestinians uh, in this country. And it's, it's very different. I got to say, living in Europe, it's very, very different. The coverage of uh, Israeli-Palestinian relationships in the United States uh, Palestinians are almost always portrayed as terrorists. The Israeli state is almost always portrayed as the innocent victim, when in reality it's quite often the opposite, that the Israeli state has fighter bombers and advanced weapons against uh, the Palestinians that are operating as a nation, but they're inside a state. So the Palestinians are an example of a nation that doesn't really have a state. They don't have self-rule. They don't have control over their territory. And the Kurds also would be an example of a stateless nation. Identity, the idea of nationhood, is something that's shared within a nation. Uh, imagined communities... Countries aren't really a good example, but sports teams where people feel an allegiance to a group and the symbols of, they often wear clothes with the colors of that group, have flags with the colors and symbols of that group. So here's, here's Kurdistan. Uh, yeah, the white, the white 
lines are the country's borders. So here's Armenia, here's Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. And then this darker blue area is a region with a higher concentration of people that are Kurdish. So this is from a recent geography text. This is from the Washington Times, a slightly different map showing national borders as black lines now. And then the area with the Kurdish majority is like this overlap. So it's, it's like Eastern Turkey and Western Iran and Northern Iraq and Northern Syria. So this would be an example in gerrymander of cracking. Like if this was a voting group, we've now split them up into and diluted their vote. So they're not a majority in Turkey. They're not a majority in Syria. They're not a majority in Iraq. They're not a majority in Iran. So they don't have really any political power in any of these countries. And here is uh, 19, I think it's 23 or 1925, with the yellow region indicating areas of uh, Kurds. So here's Turkey again. Kind of go back and forth. We've got Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and Syria. So Turkey, Iran, Iraq. Uh, Syria wouldn't have existed yet, but Turkey would have. So this region up here is Turkey. We've got Iran and Iraq. And then another, another map that I pulled in from a chapter on ethnicity from another phys, uh, human geography textbook. And I thought this was great just because it shows the incredible diversity of cultural groups across, uh, across Asia, across the Mideast. That, that many of these... So Iran, uh, talking about the idea of a nation state, Iran might be a good example of a nation state with predominantly Persian... Uh, Iraq, you can see it's made up of Kurds. It's made up of Sunni and Shiite Muslims. Syria would be a better nation state. So Iran, well, Syria might be the best nation state so far. Federalism is an idea where there's a strong central government, uh, a single entity. The state is a single entity in which the central government is ultimately supreme. Unitary states stand in contrast with federations, also known as federal states. So we've got the unitary state where there's a central government. And then there's the federal system where you have a political entity characterized by a union of partially self-governing provinces, states, or other regions under a central federal government. So the United States... Clearly an example of the federal system where we have a strong central government. However, powers, well, actually in our, in our constitutional system, powers are reserved by the states, except for those not specifically enumerated. In, <laughs> man, woo. Hey, it's almost the end of the semester. The power lies in the states, except for those powers that are specifically enumerated and given to the federal government. And then we've got green federal states, and the blue unitary states where there's a strong central government that is controlling pretty much everything. Federal states, for example, the United States, Mexico, Canada, where there is a central government. However, there's a power sharing in operation between the central government and then the local states, which in other countries would be provinces. So one of the aspects of federalism is autonomy, self-rule. Uh, the Articles of Confederation with regards to the Revolutionary War from 1776 to 1789 is why we call our states states, because they were acting at the time, early on, our states acted as countries. Uh, and so we never really changed that. Now they, would, now they should be called provinces because they are not standalone political entities. They are part of a federal system, but we still call them states. And speaking of states' rights, uh, I forgot which racist slave-owning Confederate traitor this is, but states' rights, um, many, many, many powers, as I mentioned, are reserved by the states, and states' rights has been used in the United States politically as a racist dog whistle. In fact, I totally forgot to use the word dog whistle. Dog whistle is a term where the people who are in the group, the, the target audience, hears the statement one way and the rest of the population hears it another way. 
And that's called a dog whistle. So it's like a secret coded message for your followers that nobody else or that other out members outside your group will interpret it differently because you want it to be interpreted differently by people outside the group. So for example, lies about the Civil War, that it was all about states' rights. It wasn't. It was about slavery. How do we know it was about slavery? Well, because the treasonous Confederates said so. Uh, the cornerstone speech set out the reasons for the foundation of the Confederacy in the United States, and white power was an explicit reason. However, however, this means that present-day politicians, for example, Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan understood the power of racism to motivate frightened Americans to vote. Uh, and so during Reagan's campaign, he talked about states' rights and and conservatives understood that what Reagan meant was, when he said states' rights, what he meant was, <laughs> I'm a bigot. If you don't like black people, you should vote for me. And what other people heard was a nuanced reasoning of the federal system where there's power sharing between a strong central government and states that are also uh, sharing in that power. But what Reagan really meant and what his audience totally understood is, I'm a racist just like you. So some of the past battles fought in the name of states' rights, clearly slavery. Uh, the Second Amendment is very, very uh, still, has always been a controversial issue in the United States. What does it mean? Does that mean that everybody gets a gun? Well, it pretty clearly says a well-regulated militia. So different states interpret that differently. Uh, segregation. Some states say, yes, it's, we've, we all, we've all decided that we're going to treat black people differently and we're cool with it. So you shouldn't tell us what to do. And the federal government says, no, 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 no. There's some things in the constitution, for example, the 14th amendment, the equal protection clause that everybody is, is entitled to the same protection of the law. And you can see this debate continuing on today. Uh, environmental topics, some states want to relax their environmental regulations so that they can pollute more to make more money for the short term. Uh, some of the pipelines, for example, would be an example of that, a short, uh, of something that ultimately is incredibly ecologically harmful, but short term is going to make a lot of cash for somebody, so it's going to get pushed through. So not all countries, just like all marriages, all, not all countries stay together happily ever after. So sometimes countries break apart. Uh, the right of self-determination, what, what does that actually mean? When should the United States support the right of peoples to self-determination? So the United States, on one hand, uh, supporting self-determination could be seen as hypocritical because during the Civil War, the United States said to the Southern states, no, you can't just go off and continue to enslave people. That's not the way this works. On the other hand, uh, there's times when <laughs> by denying support for self-determination, that would also be hypocritical uh, because the United States believes that people have the the right to choose their type of government to by voting to make choices about their government. This is a really, 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 really cool map showing different regions across Europe that have uh, either secessionist where they want to they want to make their own independent government. Uh, or self-rule, or, or we just want to have more local control. These are separatist movements across Europe. So we have like Scotland, which we'll talk about later. Wales, Cornwall are minority regions within England. Bretagne, where they still speak, well, some of the people speak languages that, if you remember from the chapter on language, are Celtic. So the people in Bretagne and Brittany in France, in Galatia, in Spain, and in Cornwall, and in Wales, and in Scotland. In fact, in all of those places, they're speaking Celtic languages that existed before uh, many of the waves of invasion across, across England. Uh, Germanic-speaking people, for example, the Angles, the Saxons. Uh, 
So we've got the Galatian independence movement uh, in Catalonia. We'll talk about Catalonia. There's a movement for independence in Catalonia. Here's the island of Corsica, which was sold to France, I think back in the 1700s by the Genoese in Italy. And another another map showing, well, like here's Poland, but then the Silesia, they've got their own thing going on there. Uh, here we've got Brittany again. We've got Catalonia. We've got the Basque country. We've got Galicia. We've got Scotland, Wales, Cornwall, all these regions that would like to have more autonomy, more local control. Oh, I like this because it, it really, really, really broke it down into, into far more detail than we need, where if it's italicized, they want greater autonomy, but not independence. So Frisia, for example, they don't want independence. They just want more local control. If the names are not, not italicized, for example, Aragon, Galicia, Northern Ireland, Scotland, then they also want... Uh, self-rule. They, they want not only more autonomy, but also self-rule. I apparently found many of these maps. So Scotland and Quebec are two areas that have been going back and forth culturally about independence for some time now. So what's the price and the reward of achieving self-determination? Like, yeah, congratulations. Now you've got the ability to control all, all of your own affairs and you're not dependent or subservient to a central government. That's the good news, but it could also be bad news. Uh, for example, Scotland had voted pre-Brexit in a narrow election. They had it. There was a call for independence that Scotland would be its own independent state. Uh, but very, very narrowly, they voted to remain part of the United Kingdom. However, the United Kingdom voted to bail. Uh, they voted in favor of Brexit, the British exit from the European community. Uh, and now Scotland is saying that there are now renewed calls for another independence vote for Scotland, that they don't want to be part of the E. They would rather be part of the EU than part of the UK. Quebec has voted twice to remain part of Canada. Hopefully back uh, from the chapter on language, you remember the slide, and I'll try to find a slide and drop it in later, of the how many people speak French in Quebec in the different areas of Quebec as opposed to Canada. But twice, Quebec has voted twice. After the second election, the central government made political changes that gave Quebec more local control over their Frenchness, which is what they want. So that's kind of interesting. Scotland looks like it's it's moving in favor of independence, and Quebec looks like at this point it's happy to remain part of Canada. Yugoslavia, I found a GIF on the web of the breakup of Yugoslavia from one nation into a whole bunch of fragmented nations. Yeah, 1989, Yugoslavia was held together. Uh, by a, a brutal dictator. After his death, uh, he was the main force keeping everything, keeping all of these different ethnicities and religions and nationalities together. Oh, and I was trying to remember one of my, one of the other books that I used to use, there was like a, one of those mnemonic phrases, like Seven nationalities, six ethnicities, five languages, four something else, three something, two alphabets, and one country. So here we see the, the border, the border of Yugoslavia, 1946 to 1991, on top of some of the older, the Ottoman Empire, the, yeah, you remember the Ottoman Empire up till uh, 18... 30, 1870, sometime in there. So this is the Balkans. We had the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We had the Ottoman Empire. So Yugoslavia, half of it, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, Kosovo, Macedonia, Serbia, was part of the Ottoman Empire, but Croatia and Slovenia, and I think that's also part of, Slo of uh, Serbia, was part of the Austria-Hungarian Empire. Here we've got another map. This is the current countries. 
after the breakup of Yugoslavia into Slovenia, Croatia, which is always the easiest to remember for me because it looks like a C. Thank heavens for that. Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, Kosovo, and Macedonia. It, but, <laughs> but, uh, those are the countries. So these are states, but the states are made up of nationalities. So in Slovenia, they're mainly Slovenian. In Croatia, they're Serbian and Croatian. In Bosnia, they're Serbian and Muslim and Croatian. So Bosnia Herzegovina uh, is a combination of many different different uh, ethnicities. Serbia, predominantly Serbian, with some Bulgarians, with some Hungarians, but predominantly Serbian. Kosovo, primarily uh, Albanian. So. So uh, they're carrying a their passport would say would say Kosovo, but previously they probably would have identified as Albanian. They probably speak Albanian. Uh, yeah, it's the problem when the boundaries move, but the people don't. It can be very very confusing and and difficult for the people left behind. As the result of ethnic cleansing. Uh, and I really wish I can't believe that none of these people had a had a map showing the different the different religions. So I think the Slovenians and the Croatians are predominantly Roman Catholic. The Serbians are Eastern Orthodox, and these Bosnians are predominantly Muslim. So maybe that was the three: is that you've got at least three different religions: Eastern Orthodox Christianity, Muslim and uh, Roman Catholicism, three religions going on that was a, pri that, in fact, that was the primary driver of the ethnic cleansing in a town, Sarajevo, which once held a Winter Olympics. Uh, in fact, I didn't really understand the political situation in Sarajevo until I saw the movie, Welcome to Sarajevo, uh, about the ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is when one ethnic group decides that they don't like another ethnic group and they want to make them leave. That's different than genocide. That's when one ethnic group decides that another ethnic group shouldn't exist, and so they all need to be wiped out. With ethnic cleansing, it's like, well, they live next door. They can move. I just don't want them next door. Genocide is, well, they're next door. I don't want them to be any place. So for years, there was brutal, brutal warfare primarily of Eastern Orthodox Serbs killing Muslims in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Sarajevo, especially heavy, heavy, heavy fighting. And again, predominantly Eastern Orthodox Christians massacring Muslims to, to a shocking degree. Constructed identity. So California, I think, uh, I think Dr. Graves is playing around with the idea of secession in California. Should California become a separate country? No. How could you be convinced? Well, you can answer that on your own. How could you be convinced that this is a good idea? I don't even know what it would take. When you describe yourself, what words? Yeah, should California split into different states? Let's just look at a map. So for years, people have talking have been talking about California and some of the problems with California being such a massive, massive state with so many different... I mean, the split between Southern California... And Northern California in terms of climate, in terms of population density, very, very different. And so in the United States, in California and Oregon, in the 1920s or so, there was a movement because people in Southern Oregon and Northern California watched, they thought they were watching their tax dollars go to, in this case, Sacramento, and then not come back and flow to other regions, they felt that they were being taxed, but weren't being, they, they, they had taxation, but not representation. And so they, as a joke, talked about seceding and forming a state called Jefferson. And as you drive through the North State uh, under the Trump administration, this has really picked up steam, the idea that they're going to split off from the rest of California which as a geographer, I just look at and go, okay, so, well, we'll talk about libertarians in a minute. Liber they tend to be libertarians who 
don't think they need a government for anything. Uh, they don't want to get taxed on anything, and they don't want the government to provide anything. They are rugged individuals. In the region of the state with the worst economic performance, if it wasn't for tax dollars flowing from Sacramento to Jefferson, I don't think they would have decent roads, they wouldn't have health care or education, which for many of them is fine, but I after reading articles on the economic benefits of higher education, reading articles on the role of education as a driver in economic development, I just don't see how the poorest counties in California are going to be doing better if suddenly they're not getting help from Sacramento. So other separatist movements in northern Italy, in the island of Corsica, in France, in the Basque country of Spain, and in Catalonia of Spain. So here's, you can see Catalonia is like, what is that, northeastern Spain, the Basque country, northern Spain, and then Galatia, uh, which I'm so glad I was just talking about a minute ago, where the culture is really tied more to uh, England. I mean, not, not current England, but past Celtic England. Um, and they would like to be more independent than they are. I thought this was, this is a pro- Basque separatist mural painted, I believe, in Belfast in Ireland, showing their support for not just the Basque country, but also Catalonia and Galicia. And another, another map showing the Basque flag over the Basque country and the idea that they're not Spain, they're not France, we're Basque. We are our own country. We are our own language, our own culture. We should have autarky. We should have self-rule. And this kind of weird picture, uh, I was driving by in Corsica, and this was a billboard for an independence rally on the 8th of May. And you can see it's not, it's in Corsican, which isn't English. Um, yeah, it's not English, duh. It's not French, although they are administered by France. They are a province of France, just like the rest of France. But they have their own language. That's not Italian. It's not French. It's Corsican. And they're having an independence rally in Ponte Novo, which means new bridge. The road signs in Corsica were bilingual with French and Corsican. And here is, here is a shot of the Ponte Novo. This is the new bridge. Man, you should have seen the old bridge. Uh, the Ponte Novo is a place in Corsica. Well, yeah, duh. But it's an important it's an important place because it marks the site of a of a battle between the French and the Corsicans when they were fighting for independence previously. So liberty for all the patriots. Remember, remember the new bridge, one Corsica. And this is a statue of a man named Paoli. And he was one of the leaders of the Corsican independence movement back in the 1700s. And the story goes that he was away on business and the French troops came looking for him and he wasn't home, so they shot up his house. And uh, I grew up in Southern California, went to Disneyland a lot as a kid. And so looking at this, my first thought was, oh, it's just like Pirates of the Caribbean because they've got shutters and except these were real people, not animatronic figures. And so the Corsican people, and this is, oh my God, this is great. Here we've got a statue of Paoli, the Corsican patriot, who tried to create an independent Corsica. Uh, the French, the French uh, outlasted him. So Corsica is still part of France, but this, this statue is a reminder to the Corsican people of their desire for independence. So what does this statue mean? The statue means... It's a symbol. It's symbolic of the Corsican desire for independence. That's what. That's why it's there. This is an independence rally in Catalonia, in northeastern Spain. And I saw this and I thought, I don't recognize this flag. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, the red... The red and yellow stripes I saw all over the place in uh, Catalonia when I was there back in 2006. There were, there were signs, there were billboards, welcome to Catalonia, you are in Catalonia. Not welcome to Spain, 
you know, it'd be like welcome to California. If California also had a secessionist movement, it, that that it was it was welcome to Catalonia, but it was a welcome to Catalonia that was setting apart the welcome from welcome to Spain. You're you're not you're not in Spain. You're in Catalonia. Another independence rally in Catalonia. And it turns out this is the flag that I was looking for, the, the old Catalonian, the official flag of Catalonia. There's a blue-starred Catalonian flag that's the primary symbol of Catalonian separatism. There's a red-starred flag, which is really interesting because it's got a red star, which you'd associate with communists. Uh, so this is the, the communist and left-wing Catalonian separatists would fly this. The blue is the preferred flag for center-right and center-left Republicans. So in Spain, up until the 1970s, this, uh, the Spanish government was fascist, controlled by Fran General Emisimo Francisco Franco, who was a full-on fascist. So it's interesting that cent so center-right in Spain would be these uh, fascists. The, sh the official flag of Barcelona. I love this one. It's... Uh, it's a flag. It's the blue and red version of the the flag of Catalonia done in the colors of FC Barcelona, which I thought was really funny. And then there's another one. There's another football club in Barcelona. Of course there is, or uh, RCD Espanol. So there's another separatist flag in the colors of another football club. So I just thought it was interesting. There you go. Politics, religion, what role does religion play in creating law? Well, it depends on the country. In the United States, uh, in the Constitution, the state is prohibited from, from creating or supporting a state, a state religion. That, that wall between church and state is that the state is supposed to take no role in supporting or suppressing religion in the United States. In some countries... The religion explicitly sets the laws. In Iran, for example, uh, much of the political process is controlled by the senior clerics behind the scenes. Uh, in different American states, for example, Utah, the Mormon church plays a huge role in politics in Utah. Um, where's the boundary between morality and religion? I'll leave that to you to figure out. Whose freedom is abridged by gay rights? Right. So if you're not gay and two gay people marry, I think the courts are going to have a difficult time finding how you have been injured by these two people on the other side of the country that you've never met being allowed to say that they are married. Yeah, usually people saying my rights are being taken away are people who have been blessed with privilege and when other people get those rights, it feels to them often like something has been taken away. When, when it hasn't, it's just those people now have the same rights that you do. So uh, marital privacy laws are an example of this, that in the United States up until 2003, uh, consenting adults did not have the right to do what they wanted in their bedrooms. Uh, in many cases... In many cases, this was used to perpetuate homophobic conditions in these states. Uh, laws were struck down before 1970. Up until 2003, in the darkest states, perfect, in these darker colored states, uh, it was illegal for consenting adults to do different things in the bedroom with each other. And the Supreme Court struck this down in 2003 and said, no, no, that, that they have the fundamental right. Their right to privacy trumps these laws. Uh, political cultures, um, you've probably seen the political square or taken one of those political self quizzes. Often in this country, we break things down into conservative and liberal. Often we break it down into Democrat and Republican, but, but politics is often far more nuanced, far more subtle than just black and white, conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat. So, for example, there's Western libertarians, Southern traditionalists, New England progressives, centrists. Here's that. Uh, how much power over economics should the state have? Heavily regulated, unregulated, 
And then how much control over society should there be? Should society be be strictly controlled or should people be free to do whatever they want within that society? So I thought this was interesting, uh, plotting out the U.S. presidential candidates on a left, on an economic left-right scale, on an authoritarian, authoritarian libertarian scale. And so Trump, way, way over in the far right authoritarian side, as opposed to, and where did Biden go? So Biden almost as far over to the right in terms of economics, but less authoritarian, as opposed to Elizabeth Warren, who isn't even a centrist on this, not even a centrist on this in terms of left right economic policies. So what's really happened in this country, somebody described it, I think, best as a ratchet system where the right wing moves things to the right and then the left keeps them there and the right moves things to the right again and then the left keeps them there. Many of the people in this country, <laughs> President Obama was accused of being a communist, accused of being a socialist. He wouldn't even be a centrist in most of the European countries. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, AOC, if you find the people that especially the people vilified by the right-wing press as being the most radical Marxists, they're not even centrists in most European countries. They are not even in the middle of the road. That is, over the last couple decades in the United States, the political debate, the framing of the debate has, has consistently shifted to the right and shifted to the right and shifted to the right and shifted to the right. So an example of one of these political cultures would be Western libertarians, they're not in favor of paying taxes. They don't want any rules on anything. They don't want any government services. If I want a road, me and my buddies will get together and we'll pay for our own road. Thank you very much. No regulation of the environment. Businesses should just make money. Don't worry about it. The environment will take care of itself. We don't need restrictions on how much pollution my car can make. In fact, at one of the recent one of the recent debates, the libertarian candidates were, were, were actually debating and accusing each other of being not a real libertarian because they said that people should have to get a driver's license. You should have to be, you should have to take a test. In fact, the libertarians, the hardcore libertarians in this debate were saying, no, it's ridiculous. The government doesn't, doesn't get to tell me what I need to do to drive a car. I don't need to take a test to prove that I need to drive a car. Yeah. So libertarians, if I can make money doing things to my land, I should be able to. It doesn't matter what I do to the environment. Does Nothing else matters except money and being free from regulations. Uh, many of these people, ironically, are really wealthy. For example, the Bundys, uh, the the people that took over the, Mal the Malheur Wildlife Refuge in Oregon, the Bundys have made millions off of government leases on public lands. So all of our tax dollars are paying to support the Bundys making millions off of grazing their cattle on public land. The, the reason they took over the wildlife refuge is they were tired of having to pay their way for feeding their cattle on public land. So they stopped paying. So the government was upset with them. That's what they've been feuding about the government with, about they don't want to, they don't want to have to pay for anything. And they became heroes and then walked away after occupying a wildlife refuge for a considerable amount of time. So you got your libertarians. They're class by classical economics. What I mean is low taxes, low services, Southern traditionalists, uh, can be summarized as saying traditional order must be maintained. And it occurred to me today, how much of this really goes back to slavery? Like the whole culture was terrified of with good reason of the blacks that they had been brutalizing, rising up and slaughtering them. And it really seems like we're still there. That everything that the South was about tradition, that tradition was enslaving black people and dominating them in every possible way. So they say they don't like big government, but as you saw from the marital privacy, they're fine telling people what they can do in the bedroom. The big government should stay out of my life. However, that doesn't mean that gay people should be married. The government should definitely be in their life. The government should stay out of my life. 
However, I don't think people should get abortions, so I'm okay with laws that say that you can't get an abortion. So they they say that they don't like big government, but typically they support incredibly intrusive laws that align with their particular religious views. Yeah, post Civil War there were Democrats. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza, the the convicted felon, keeps saying, "Yeah, the the Democrats." Uh, the Democrats in the South were the ones that were in favor of slavery and the Republicans weren't. Well, during the civil rights era, many of those Democrats have become Republicans uh, in order to maintain racist policies. This has been a deliberate political strategy, especially of the Republican Party. You can see it up right up through the Trump campaign. Mexicans are rapists with calves the size of cantaloupes from, binging, from smuggling bales of marijuana over our border. In New England, a different culture, a progressive moralist. So by progressive, that would be more social spending, higher taxes, more public services from the government. That liberal, it's a word and its meaning is now meaningless. New England had a history of having village greens. That is to say, common space that was available for everyone to use, like by raising cattle on it, for example. And they had the idea that uh, the common good was something to strive for, that, that that was an ideal. Not just my individual benefit, but the common good was important. Uh, and I really got to take exception with Dr. Gray's treatment of the tragedy of the commons. The tragedy of the commons was an idea. It was the title of an essay written by a very influential ecologist named Garrett Hardin that said, if you have a common space, what's going to happen is somebody's going to come in and use it all up. So you really shouldn't have common space because somebody will mess it up. That's pretty much it, actually. And it turns out there's no evidence for this, that the commons as they existed in England before the enclosure movement, the commons as they existed in New England, were maintained by the people. Garrett Hardin totally forgot this ideal of the common good, that within these towns, they would have had mechanisms in place to ensure that people would continue to use the village greens, that they would be kept up, that nobody would raise too many animals that would damage the ecological sustainability of it. So the tragedy of the commons is really bullshit. It's a convenient story for people that don't like public land, people that think that there shouldn't be public land, people that think all the, all the land should be in private hands because that's the best way to make a profit, love the tragedy of the commons. And just within the last couple of months, there was another article out talking about, hey, this idea is, it's, it's wrong. It's incredibly powerful and people loved it when they read it. It resonated with people, but it turns out it's completely wrong and it's given us the wrong idea that there is no tragedy of the commons. So that, that's interesting. This idea then in New England of the common good still being very, very important. People like Bernie Sanders, for example, coming out of New England saying, yes, everybody should be able to go to school. No one should go to bed hungry. Everyone should have a roof over their head. Everyone should have health care. That's the common good. Uh, Keynesian econ economics is the idea that, that you can have a better society by appropriately taxing the wealthy, by appropriately taxing everyone to support social programs that will ultimately benefit the whole society. Uh, FDR, very involved with Keynesian ex economics, bringing us out of the Great Depression. Uh, and it's interesting, very, very similar. FDR's policies to bring America out of the Great Depression are in many ways very similar to President Biden's policies right now with the stimulus packages. And for, the, for this reason that Biden's, many of these policies are also based on uh, Keynesian economic policies. Uh, the Nordic model. So the Nordic model, Nordic refers to uh, Northwestern Europe, Scandinavia is another term for the Nordic countries. But the Nordic countries typically have very high tax rates. Well, I was going to say very high, like 50%. But in the US, 
back in the 1950s, I think we had 40s and 50s in the United States, we had tax rates on the wealthiest Americans of 70%. So back in the day in the United States, we had better tax rates on the extremely wealthy. Uh, the Nordic model is a progressive tax rate where income is, is taxed at a higher and higher rate as you earn more income. Uh, schools, education, healthcare, housing, those things are, are government benefits that people have a right to healthcare, people have a right to free education. So the Nordic model more closely aligned with people like Bernie Sanders and this, this idea of New England progressives. Oh, and then this, this all played out in the chapter on development, right? So we had the movement of factories from a region with higher tax rates and more control to the South, where they didn't have unions, didn't have a lot of governmental reg regulation, and were very, we're, we're still operating on, you know, mentally still operating on the slavery idea where the workers need to put, be, the workers need to be put down and controlled, and the owners are the people who deserve our protection as the government. The, the government should protect the owners, not the workers. New England centrists, uh, yeah, they're the middle of the road people. Midwesterners are often considered centrists. They're on the blue red spectrum, they're purple. Ohio physically is a swing state. Ohio politically is a swing state. Typically, Ohio very important in presidential elections because they have a lot of electoral votes and also because Ohio can go either way. Unlike California, New York, or Georgia, uh, there's a very there isn't a clear majority in Ohio of one political affiliation or another. Yeah, so they go back and forth. Um, where do people get political orientation? As a culture, where do we get our political beliefs? How persistent are these beliefs? I would say very persistent. So some of the ideas, Albion's, Albion is a term for, for ancient England, that the British ideas of government were very influential. So as invading colonists came from England, they brought with them their ideas about government, which makes sense. But they weren't just one group of people. They weren't monolithic. They weren't a monoculture. They were all kinds of different people. So uh, the doctrine of first effective settlement. So the Puritans had very different ideas uh, about how a government should be run, about should you have a central authority, how much freedom should individuals have. They were primarily a religious group as opposed to the class conscious commercial colony of Jamestown. They were all about making money. So you've got a group of religious refugees, and then you've got a group of money-hungry capitalists. It would make sense that their ideals of government would be different, and that that founding group would set, would set up the government, would create the culture that would then be perpetuated over time. Cadastral systems, that would be how you divide up your land, uh, like the the British meets and bounds system, the French long lot technique, or the Jeffersonian public land survey system and the township and range grid created to, to control land, to take political control over land and divide it up and sell it for ownership. And Graves talks a bit about possibly how the cadastral system used in a region would contribute to the political culture of that region. Oh yeah, totally interesting idea that that the fall line cities, remember those cities that were along the East Coast that had mills for textiles back in the day, that that would be an example that industrialization hit New England first. And so some of the ideas that they were grappling with in terms of economic power and how uh, money should be distributed, how people should be taxed, that they had those ideas first. So they had a progressive, socially inclusive philosophy of taxing people to provide benefits for society. As opposed to the South, 
and looking at poor soil conditions in the South, that they developed a very rigid class-based society. Again, the South hasn't, as, as a country, we haven't dealt with slavery. The South has not dealt with slavery. They have not moved beyond that. Uh, and so they had a rigid class-based society because of the danger of slavery's volts. So you have a very strong government. In fact, uh, if we had more time, we'd look at the roots of policing. The first police police units in the United States were slave patrols that were only concerned with black people. Uh, so when you look at racism in institutions, for example, racism today in policing, it goes back to the, to the foundation that they were racist at the very beginning looking for escaped slaves. So literally from day one, cops have only been looking at black people. And then in the Western states, you know, the, the cowboy states, that there wasn't – in New England, you had towns. You had towns. You had cities. You had cities and towns in New England with people living in high density, living next to each other, as opposed to people on the plain states, this rugged individual. I've got 160 acres, and I can't even see the smoke from my neighbor's fire. I'm going to have a different ideas about what the government should provide to me, Right. If there isn't anything. Uh, so, you know, in some ways, this really, it, it strikes true that New England has this progressive, socially inclusive philosophy, or more so than the South, and more so than the Plain States does. Electoral cartography is mapping out of elections, and typically they're mapped red, blue, and it's funny, I, I had, I, yeah, we talk about red states and blue states, and in the United States, we got it backwards. Any place else in the world, if you're mapping out states that are red, I would assume that they're communist or at the very least socialist. But in this country, red states are Republicans and blue states are Democrats. What are the problems? Well, and I like this sentence, cartography must communicate clearly rather than obfuscate. Yes, eschew obfuscation. Obfuscation means the opposite of making things clearer. It means making things murkier and less clear. So this is an electoral vote map of the last election, Biden-Trump. And it, it mapped out at the state scale, except for Nebraska and Maine. Mapped out at the state scale, it's, it's blue and red, right? And here's the source for that. So here is another blue and red map. This one is at the county scale. And it was a map like this that encouraged Laura Trump to tweet out, impeach this, with a map of the 2016 election, which actually turned out, turns out the map that she used had some of the, had some of the uh, counties flipped red that actually weren't. So she started off with a lie and said, impeach this. And, uh, this guy, Kareem Doob, said, yeah, land doesn't vote, people vote. And so now instead of looking, oh, and this would go back to week, yeah, week one, talking about maps, that the assumption, our, our brains look at this and assume that each of these areas, that all of the areas have equal weight that this big red square carries the same weight as this big blue square, but that's just not true. In many of these states, there's hardly anybody there. So what, what this guy did was made the circles proportionate to the number of votes. And you can see like the Midwest, there's nothing there. So moving on, this is that same map where now each circle is proportional to the number of votes and color-coded based on whether it went red or blue. Another, another political map from the last election, and this one using proportional shades of red and purple and blue. Because, yeah, there's no, like, actually red state, there's no blue state. The best we've got is 75-75. And I like this, uh, looking at it just at grayscale, it tells a totally different story. Looking at this, you'd say, well, that's like, that's the lightest. And I don't know, that might be the darkest. Maybe that's the darkest, but. 
Okay, electoral politics. So now we're talking about districts, which are the voting areas. Everybody lives inside a voting district. You might live inside different districts. Voting districts for, for example, I live in Davis, so I'm in one district for local Davis politics. I'm in a state assembly person district. I'm in a state senator's district. I'm in a federal representative's district, and I'm also in a federal senator's district. So those are electrical, electoral districts. Precinct is the smaller scale where you actually go to vote. You can have mal. Mal means bad. So apportionment is the process of looking at a map with all the people in it and then making those districts. And by doing it deliberately, you can put more people than you should or fewer people than you should, and that's called malapportionment. Redistricting is why we have the census. Every 10 years under the Constitution, the U.S. government is supposed to count all the people and then divide up the representative seats in a process called redistricting. This is incredibly important. It's one of the reasons that this last census was so political because the Trump administration wanted to end it early, wanted to include citizenship questions and do as much as they could to reduce the number of minority people in the, uh, reduce the apparent numbers, reduce the apparent numbers and therefore the political power of minorities in the United States. So if you include citizenship questions, then undocumented people aren't going to fill out the form because maybe they're afraid they'll get deported, which means that you don't count them. So they're not there. So you can't provide them services. So redistricting has become incredibly political. It might have always been incredibly political. Gerrymandering is breaking up these districts in such a way that you're deliberately taking away political power from a group. So as the result of gerrymandering, you can have safe districts where a, where a given representative's district is made up of the proportion of the political parties are such that no matter what they do, they're going to get reelected. They, they can't not get reelected because the district was designed to include so many supporters that there's nothing they can do. So what this means then is there's no need to compromise on anything. So who benefits? Well, they benefit, their political donors benefit, but if you are, if they're the, if, yeah, who benefits? The representatives benefit. Who does not? The people that voted for them, unless they're, unless they're actually being represented. Um, because if you've got a safe district, you don't need to compromise. You don't need to listen to anybody else. What's the harm beyond the district is you get political gridlock. Uh, typically, people get disinterested in elections because it doesn't matter. There's nothing I can do. Even if everybody, even if I and everybody I know vote, that other guy is still going to win. So there's no point voting. Open primaries would take care of part of the problem of gerrymandering. By open primaries, and California has open primaries, it doesn't matter what party you're registered for. In the primary, you can vote for whomever you want. And then in the election, you can vote for whomever you want. So political gridlock over time, 1947 to 2014, the number of laws made during each Congress going from 1,000 down to 400, 300, 200, 165. A lot of this could be attributed most recently to, you know, the political mastery of Mitch McConnell in deliberately not allowing any judges to be confirmed under President Obama. So there would be huge, a huge list of vacancies to be filled when Trump became president uh, and also just stopping all of the laws that he didn't have any interest in. But even if we don't look at Mitch McConnell, you can see that there's a clear trend in fewer and fewer and fewer laws being passed during each Congress. Part of this is due to gerrymandering and the fact that districts are safe, so nobody has to compromise. So a couple things you can do with gerrymandering. There's packing and cracking. With packing, if you're in a district you and there's only a few people of the opposition, you can pack them all into one district. And so let's say you're the area, let's say there's five districts, you can give your opponent one, that way you've got four, they've got one, and you're always going to win. Uh, 
that's that's what packing is. You pack all of the op- opposition into one or a couple districts. So they have some power, but in the larger scheme, they don't. Cracking would be like you take that one district and you divide up the boundary lines in such a way that you get a few opposition people in each district. So there's no district where the opposition has a majority. They still have no political power. So some of the examples. Ah, in the in one of the assignments that you're going to have, they talk about uh, what a perfect district would look like. And a perfect district would actually be a, a sphere or a circle, rather. Um, that they look at the perimeter to area ratio to determine how gerrymandered a district is. That's one of the measures that they can use is look at the the length of the perimeter and divide that by the area. And let's see, uh, a perfect circle would be one where the ratio of the area of the perimeter to the area would be one. As the perimeter gets higher and higher and higher, it's more and more gerrymandered. So you've got like Illinois fourth, Louisiana's fourth, North Carolina's 12th, so these could all be examples. North Carolina could be example of packing. Louisiana could be an example. And Illinois could be packing. Uh, the capper, California is 23rd. This is an old, old, old district. It's been redrawn. But you can see it's just coast. It's going from Monterey to San Luis Obispo to Santa Barbara all the way down to Oxnard. But it's just coastal, coastal Democrats. So that would be, I would think, an example of packing where you're putting... You know, the people over here, Republican, Republican, Republican. So you got this little ribbon of Democratic voters. And as, uh, yeah, of proof of the effectiveness of gerrymandering for the Republican Party uh, would be looking at the numbers. There's a couple studies done looking at the share of the popular vote and then how many representatives Democrats and Republicans have gotten. And it's just amazing how much of an advantage the Republicans have as a result of their partisan gerrymandering. Uh, recently, there's been a couple court cases that have been interesting. There was a Republican strategist who d- his life's work was was creating power for Republicans by gerrymandering. And after his death, his daughter found his hard drives and donated them, which had documents, presentations, data analysis that laid out exactly how he was how he had gone about um, gerrymandering all of these districts all over the United States. Yeah, so what's the cost? Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, Bernie Sanders, they don't need to compromise because there's no there's no need because they don't need they're not worried about being primaried. So in the general election, it usually comes down to two candidates. Before that, there's the primary when each party is determining their candidate. And at, at both, at all those steps, if you're Ted Cruz, because of the way your district's being drawn, there's nobody who can challenge you. So you don't have to listen to anybody. You don't have to perform representative government anymore is what that means. So uh, some more articles. I'll, I'll, I will add that to the list of articles that I want you to read through and answer some questions on. Uh, political landscapes. So shifting gears from gerrymandering to political landscapes. What do political landscapes say? They say, I'm important. They say, I'm a real country and I'm important and I have power and you don't. So here we've got the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., the Capitol building. And Washington, D.C. was conceived. Uh, This is the Pierre L'Enfant plan of Washington, D.C. Here you can see the Capitol, and you can see these long boulevards that then end with these sight lines of important buildings. And this was deliberate. This was based on, for example, Paris. Here we have the Arc de Triomphe with these broad sight lines. In fact, Paris in the 1700s was redone by Baron von Haussmann. And one of the things you can see, instead of these narrow streets, instead of the alleyways and the narrow streets, they had these wide boulevards. And the the purpose of the wide boulevards was not just to create these these, uh, really dramatic sight lines, but also for political control. Uh, After the French Revolution, when the peasants seized power from the monarchy, 
uh, the monarchy got got some of the power back and said, wow, we should make sure that the peasants can't do that again. So they made they made the streets wider so that you could have cavalry charges. They straightened them so that you could use cannons to fire down the streets. And they made all of this, all the buildings had to line up along the same line. The frontage of the buildings had to be on the same line. And part of that was so that people couldn't hide and it was easier to shoot them. But a very important aspect of Paris was its, uh, its political theater. Looking at the landscapes in Paris, you are impressed at the ability of the country to create these monuments. Uh, in the United States, a lot of political and also banks have used this Greek revival style with these Greek columns to say, ah, oh, yes, this is why we're legitimate. It's because our roots go back to the Greeks. Well, maybe your ideas do, but we're picking up architectural ideas as a symbol of Greek ideas of democracy. So a lot of buildings in the United States are Greek revival. A lot of governmental buildings are Greek revival to create this artificial sense of dignity and importance. Architecture of power. Oh, I forgot the name of this plantation. It's in the book. It's in the, it's in the chapter. I found another picture. Oh, what the heck was it? It, it doesn't matter. It's a plantation. It's in Louisiana and people go there to get married. The other day I looked at the cushions on some of my lawn furniture and it was the plantation collection. I thought, oh my God, those have to be white people. I mean, if you're white, plantations are where cotton was grown and people sipped mint juleps. If you're African-American, Plantations are where slaves were kept and beaten and raped and tortured and killed, and your children would be sold, would be stolen from you and sold as property. They were not your property. So the idea of plantations as a positive, as a joyful place, a place that you would go to celebrate your beautiful marriage, I just find shocking. Probably because I grew up in California and I didn't grow up in Louisiana. So the architecture of power, uh, and, and Graves talks about this, as an African-American, this has a very different meaning than as a white person. Uh, so going from these, as an African-American, realizing that this is, not a, this is not a safe space. This is not a welcoming space. This is a dangerous, hostile space. And then they've adopted that that same architecture for courts. So as an African-American going to court, you already know that you've lost because it's more slaving architecture. Architecture of power. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial was a very controversial uh, object, on a very controversial space when it was first designed and installed. Oh, it's an embarrassing gash in the ground. And it, it has turned into a very powerful symbol of the loss and the tragedy of the Vietnam War. So we've got Washington again. We've got Paris. What does that say? Uh, and I forgot which racist this is. It's either Stonewall Jackson, uh, but I thought, I, I literally cannot imagine, I cannot imagine, cannot imagine. In the United States, after slavery, there persist memorials to the Confederacy that were erected by the white losers in these states. As a reminder to the blacks, we might have lost the war, but we're, here, we're still here and you still have no power. That was the explicit message of these monuments, the explicit message of the Ku Klux Klan, for example. It was all about uh, terrorism of the black community after the Civil War. And we've allowed them to persist. That I would argue this is exactly the designers of this statue would absolutely love this picture. Uh, the Confederates were traitors. They abandoned their oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, one of the largest largest losses of life because of these treasonous traitors. And yet, uh, 
This is, uh, this is Lee Circle. This is in New Orleans in Louisiana. And as a black person, it's, it's, it's huge until they removed him. Uh, we also have army bases named after Confederate officers. Fort Bragg, home of the Special Forces. Uh, Fort Benning, home of the Infantry School. Fort Gordon, Fort Pickett, Fort Lee. So I, it would be like, it would be like if in Germany, well, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to make a Hitler analogy, but it doesn't really work. These people were traitors. Oh yeah, Benedict Arnold. There you go. It'd be, we don't have a Fort Benedict Arnold, but we've got all of these forts named after Confederate officers. In fact, this was very controversial. Trump loved this. Under the Trump administration uh, in Congress, there was discussion of changing the names of Confederate bases, and Trump came out firmly against that. as opposed to other countries and how they dealt with post-slavery. This is Haiti. This is uh, Le, Le Negre Marron, the unknown slave. Uh, this was a slave in Haiti who blew on this conch shell to let everybody know that uh, the revolution was now. And a slave uprising started after the blowing of this conch shell. So in Haiti, there's a statue of a man that's very clearly a slave Blowing, blowing on a conch shell, holding a machete at the start of the revolution that will that would liberate them. Okay, so uh, in Haiti we've got statues of a slave in the in the process of freeing himself. In Barbados, there's the Emancipation Statue to commemorate the hundredth and uh, the hundred and fiftieth anniversary of the abolition of slavery in Barbados. We have a statue to an another enslaved African who liberated himself, led a Curacao slave revolt, the largest slave rebellion on the island. I believe he was tortured to death on the site that the statue stands today. So here is one slave liberating two other slaves by literally breaking their chains. Redemption song in Jamaica. Anscafeld slave memorial in Martinique the Thomas Alexander Dumas Slavery Memorial in France. So in all these other countries, at the end of slavery, they put up statues to celebrate the liberation of slaves. In the United States, they put up statues to remind the blacks, you have no power. Ah, the 1763 monument in Guiana, in Africa. Dominica, another emancipation monument. Another view of the Guiana 1763 monument. And I wanted to point out that the, the Confederate statues in the United States weren't built after they weren't built after the Civil War. It wasn't after the Civil War. It was during Reconstruction when African Americans in the United States were gaining political and economic power. That's when the statues went up. And then again during the Civil Rights Movement. So at times in history in the United States when racist laws are struck down and equal rights are what is actually happening. White people responded to equal rights, to equality, as if something had been taken from them. And indeed it was. The right to enslave other human beings was taken from them during the Civil War. That was the whole point of the Civil War. But just the reminder was enough to cause them to go on this fit of monument building uh, during Reconstruction and then during the Civil Rights Era. More monuments, more schools, more things named after slavery. Again, to remind blacks, yeah, you might have the civil rights movement in your favor, but we're still, you still have no power. Confederate monuments and black lynching. There is an incredibly powerful black lynching memorial in the United States. Another showing... Uh, how many monuments were installed. So here we got 1900, 1910, the first huge boom, along with the founding of the NAACP. The Tulsa Race Massacre. Uh, it's called a riot here. It wasn't a riot. It was a massacre. The National Guard was murdering blacks in Tulsa in a region that was called Black Wall Street because it was wealthy, because blacks there were successful. Uh, the HBO series Watchmen did a great job of discussing the Tulsa massacre. It was called the race. It was called a riot, so that so that insurance companies wouldn't have to pay out. If it's a riot, 
then the insurance companies don't have to pay for the African Americans who lost their businesses, who lost their homes. If it's a massacre, well, then they'd have to pay out. So it was called the riot. And then same deal during the civil rights era of the 1960s. We see a, a proliferation of schools being named. Oh, the, oh God. Yeah, schools. I can't imagine. Yeah. It'd be like, can you imagine being a Jewish student and having to go to Adolf Hitler Elementary School? No? How about Robert E. Lee Junior High School if you're African American? That would totally be Stonewall Jackson Elementary School. Perfectly fine in the U.S. Uh as a result of the awareness of the racism that is persistent in the United States, especially in policing there and the Black Lives Matter movement, many of these Confederate memorials, people, it's like people realized what they were and enough people came together and said, no, that's bullshit. Stonewall, Stonewall Jackson is no one's hero. There is nothing that we should be looking at. We should not be looking to this person for inspiration. Harriet Tubman. I love the idea of replacing Confederate statues with statues of freedom fighters. In this case, we have uh, a quote and an image of Harriet Tubman being projected on, I think, one of those Stonewall Jackson monuments that has subsequently been dismantled. And that's it for politics and power. I hope you, uh, hope you find the chapter interesting. Hope you learned some stuff and good luck.